I want to read from the book of Jude, verses uh, 12 through 13. 12 to 13, then we'll go back to 2 Peter and we'll read verses 17 to 21. Jude, verses 12 to 15. These are men who are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you without fear, carrying for themselves clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the blackness has been reserved forever. That whole description, really from like the third verse through verse 16, describes false teachers. Second Peter, verses 17 to 22. Second Peter, Peter, verse 17 to 22. These are springs without water, and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, Promise, promising free, them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the truth proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your interest in our lives. Thank you for sending Jesus Thank you for giving us the word. Thank you that through Christ, through faith in his finished work, we can have a right relationship with you, having been justified by faith, forgiven of all our trespasses. It is amazing to us that you consider us. And we are grateful, Father. We don't come to you in some pious religious garb and thinking that our good works have brought us to a place where we have a standing with you. No, it is through faith in Jesus, understanding we're great sinners, but you've provided a great Savior. And so we approach you in that way today. We are asking that you would speak to us from your word. We are desperate to hear what you have to say now. Father, I pray for those today that can't be with us, those who are hurting, those have health issues. Those, each of us, Father, as we stand before you, we have need for you to help us in our relationships. And Father, as a as a congregation, we pray that we would keep our eyes focused on Jesus, keeping the gospel before us and setting it before others that they might know the true freedom that is in him. Father, we want to grow. Part of our growth is understanding what you've given in your word. And for that, we're thankful. Help me to proclaim as I should today, the listener to respond and myself as is right, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Unmasking the masquerade. That's what we're talking about today. We've been, this is our third time looking at this second chapter, I think third, maybe fourth. Uh, but we've been examining it. Uh, we started with that great salvation. Peter wrote about that in, in that first chapter. And we've moved, been moving along from that, this amazing grace that God has provided for believers. And you see the apostles' concern. You see the Spirit's concern for the body of Christ as we approach this second chapter. It's a hard-hitting chapter. It's difficult. It's to the point. It's a warning. And so we continue today with that in the, these last few verses. The truths that we have enumerated in this chapter Listen, they're of such importance that they're actually mentioned almost verbatim in the book of Jude. I can read you more of the book of Jude. But Jude speaks to the issue of false teachers and gives a similar warning to believers as Peter does in this second chapter. Why? What can we deduct from this? Well, false teachers and their deceptive doctrines are something that the body of Christ will be dealing with until the Lord calls us home or until Christ comes. It's a fact. There are false teachers in the body of Christ in churches. 
These damaging doctrines have impacted the body of Christ negatively and have impeded the witness and impact of the church in our communities and in the world. Two false teachings that have strongly come to my mind and have impacted this community, this state, and the world. And they are just a couple that, that are this, that God is, uh, there's this universalism, universal salvation, that God is so loving and so kind. His love is such that in the end, he just brings all people into heaven no matter what, no matter their response to the gospel. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these two things I'm going to give you now, but John 3.36 is very clear. This is not true. Yes, God is loving. He's kind. His love is amazing. It's beyond grasp. But there's another side of God. That's his justice. And the scripture is clear. There are those who know God and have a relationship through faith in Christ. There are those who do not. And their destinies are different. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Just a clear statement, faith in Christ. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So, not everyone goes to heaven. Now, that has been, that's, that, that's, a, that's a doctrine that is, is, is spoken of in this community, and there are those that believe in universal salvation, that everyone in the end is good. God's loving. We're all his children. The other is this, and I've spoken on it numerous times, that working really hard, doing some measure of good works, being a religious person, having some religious experience gets you in. In other words, uh, God must grant me heaven. I have merit before him. I've done, and we list those things. Two verses I'll give you. Again, I'm not spending much time here. Romans 4 or 5 speaks to that false teaching that I just gave you, and that is that I believe I can do something to the point that God just says, hey, you're good, you're in. There's my own works. Romans 4, 5, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. See, it says the one who does not work. And then it talks about his faith is credited as righteousness. One of the biggest lies in the UP, I hear it all the time is that, hey, I'm not as bad as that guy. You know, I haven't killed anyone, and I, can, uh, I know someone that's worse than I, so I'm good to go. Romans 4, 4 5 makes it clear. It's not by some work, not by some merit. Similar in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you've been saved. It's a gift. It's God's grace to you. You've been saved by faith. That is, you believe in the finished work of Christ. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, Righteousness, justification is a gift. It's a gift of God, not as a, as a result of what works, and that, that no one would boast, and we certainly would. So those two things, those are two false teachings that you and I run around all the time. They're out there. Where did they come from? I believe they, in part, came from false teachers who teach people those things. So we're talking about these false teachers. There will be... The scripture's clear. There will be false teachers among us. They're in the church. There's false teachers teaching right now why I'm teaching. They're preaching. They're in the churches. They'll go later. They've gone before all week. There'll be doctrines that are taught that are not true. But notice their description here. Peter gives us this description of, of these false teachers. By the way, on the back of your, your bulletin, there's an outline to this sermon. If you wanted to take notes, fill in the blanks. Their description, verses 12, and excuse me, verse, where am I at here now? i got to find my spot. I'm in First Peter, so it makes it tough. 12 and, excuse me, 17, 18. We'll get it yet. Especially verse 17. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm whom the black darkness has been reserved. goes on in 18. We'll touch that in a minute. But here's their description in the present. Peter's describing them. And you have noticed, if you've looked close here, in this second chapter, he's just come from every angle, every angle. It's like he's leaving no stone unturned for the body of Christ to consider false teachers. Springs, he describes them here. These are springs without water. 
mist driven by a storm. And then he talks about their future for whom the black darkness has been reserved. To have a spring without water is to invite disaster. Mist driven by the wind. It looked like a rain shower. You guys have had that before. Great. Here comes a thunderstorm. We're desperate for, we're desperate for a rain, and it just dissolves. There's nothing to it. The moisture, the air promised to bring a good amount of precipitation. It didn't happen. It didn't deliver. It was empty. Both of these words, pictures, both of these word pictures, the spring, the, the, the mist driven by a storm, they describe the present reality of the character of these false teachers. You know and understand we cannot live without water. In Michigan and the surrounding states, we have an abundance of it. The streams, the rivers, the lakes, and of course the Great Lakes teem with plenty of water. If you're from the Midwest, if you're in the UP, you understand there's a lot of water around here. We don't have to look far. But in the climate that Peter lived in, a well or spring was vital, vital to sustaining one's life. The human body cannot function without the right amount of it. And the need for it is obvious, but especially so to those in those arid countries. There's no life. That's what he's getting at. There's nothing. There's no substance to these false teachers. They don't have life within. Remember, they've rejected Jesus. The first verse in the second chapter, they've rejected, the, denied the master who bought them. And as such, they had never experienced the transformative power of the cross, of new life in Christ, of being born again. That was never theirs. And so, they have nothing solid to lean on. Such, they cannot give what they've never experienced or possessed. They're spiritually dead. Spiritually dead, having set aside the word of God and rejected what it teaches. Brian Hughes said of, of these and their foundation, because obviously they have no foundation here. They've rejected Christ, rejected the word. He said this, they don't have any fixed conviction drawn from the word of God. They don't have any firm convictions drawn from the inspired scriptures. There's no life. That's presently what it is to be in the heart of a false teacher. They have nothing to offer, and they have no life with no spiritual life within their fickle. You see the future for them as well in verse 17. And it is sobering. Look with me again at the end of verse 17. For whom the black darkness has been reserved. He's talked about them being condemned. He has mentioned that they are in a terrible place. And here he uses these words that are striking. I believe this to be one of the most sobering passages, phrases in all of Scripture. The black darkness. If you wonder where their destination and abode will be, here it is. It's a reference to hell. Jesus used similar terminology, a similar phrase. He spoke of those uh, sons of the kingdom who will be cast into the outer darkness in that place. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew eight twelve. This is the reality of the future of these false teachers, and it is sobering. What Peter is mentioning here is a truth that all false teachers seek to erase and deny. The reality of a place of suffering for all those who rejected the word of truth and the master who bought them. I don't have the scripture up there, but in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 14, you see there that there's the great white throne judgment where all unbelievers will one day stand before the Lord. The books will be open to prove that they deserve about what they're going to deserve what they're about to get, and hell will be cast into a lake of fire which burns forever and ever. Sobering, difficult. I want you to know something about that place. There are no parties in that place. There is no joy in that place. There's no telling jokes in that. Place. No fellowship with others in that place. And darkness, 
outer darkness day after day after day after day after day. According to Luke 16, the rich man who went to hell, Jesus speaks of there, he wanted to warm up, warn others of it. He wanted no one else, especially his family, to come to the place where he was at. We think of COVID-19. Man, this has been a long, I have to tell you, it's wearing, isn't it? Day after day, we hear new reports. Day after day, this is going on. That's only been a few months, you guys. The lake of fire is a place that is forever and ever and ever. There's no changing it once a person is there. These are sobering words I'm speaking to you. These are, this is the place for these false teachers according to the word of God. It's also the place, listen to me, for those who have rejected Jesus as Savior. And again, very, very sobering. I don't like to think of this at all. But you have people in your family, and so do I. We have neighbors that one day this will be their place. Now, the good news is this. God doesn't desire that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He offers you and I today the gift of eternal life. How do you access that gift? It's by faith. It's by trust. You reach out in faith and take that gift. That's what you do. Understand this, you have, if you're without Christ, you have nothing to offer to God, and your sin has condemned you. Your sin says, I'm in line to incur the wrath of God. But God, in his grace, offers to you something amazing. Forgiveness, fellowship, freedom, eternal life. And he offers that to you today. And I would encourage you, if you're here without Jesus, you don't know where, where your destination is, that you will deal with that before you leave this place today. That's their future. That's their description. In the present, uh, springs without water, mist driven by the wind. In the future, condemnation. The black darkness has been reserved. Not a pretty description of false teachers. I want you to notice as well their words. They're given in verses 18 and 19. Here they are. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshy desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. Those words, uh, they're described, I believe, in just a couple ways. They're arrogant, they're vain, and they're in enticing. Those who barely escape, I believe that's, that's either immature Christians or babes in Christ in verse 18. But we see it, their arrogance is typical of most false teachers. They've rejected the truth. That takes pride and arrogance to do that. They've gone astray. It fits a mindset of these people. They know better than the rest of us. And speak as if they are the final authority in all things. I remember hearing of a pastor some years ago, and I had people saying, hey, you've got to listen to this guy. He, he's, he's, he can really give it. And I listened to a couple of his, his podcasts. A couple of things I noted about this individual, that he was, he was bold, uh, brash, and there was an arrogance to his preaching. I could go on in description about this individual. But I want you to know something about this man. His personal life was a mess. He, taught, he, he treated people so inappropriately and unloving. That's what he was. But that arrogance really got me. As I heard him, I'm like, something's not right here. Something just isn't right. It was, that arrogance was displayed in the pulpit. It was just a snippet of what others experienced who served with him. Those are arrogant words they give. Uh, vain words as well. Notice that, speaking out arrogant words of vanity. Vain. These words are empty. They're useless. They have no spiritual power within them. Uh, they're nothing but hot air. Words of vanity clearly can be seen by those who are mature and growing in Christ. When we hear those kind of words, those who have, have, are growing in Christ, those who are mature, we just pick up on that. We're saying, Where, where's this guy going? Where's this person going? Where's this podcast going? Where's this book going? We, we see it for what it is. We should never make an assessment of a teacher or preacher, listen, by how well he presents the material. Something I have noted through the years, that the body of Christ can really be swayed 
by someone who's good looking, someone who really can speak, someone who knows their material well. And people will just grab that instead of listening to the content. What is that person saying? That's key. Words mean things, they have meanings. And so what a person, uh, the content is everything. And always remember, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, context of any verse, any teaching, that's the key. What is said before and what is said after. You can know this. You, anybody can make the word of God say anything they want to. Anybody can. That's how we've strayed so far from the written word of truth, and we have so many crazy things out there today. But they're vain words. That's what God says about these false teachers. It's vanity. Before God, it's vain. And notice the effect of these words, though, as well. It says they entice. Their lives, by what they say and what they teach, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. They're enticing words. Arrogant, vain, enticing words betray the reality that is theirs. We must be so careful of these enticing words. We should never make an assessment of a teacher or preacher simply by how well he can speak. We must listen to what they say. Doctrine matters. Pharisees in our Lord's day, they had some enticing words. If you and I lived in that day, most likely we would have looked up to these teachers of the law. But this is what Jesus said about them. Woe to you, scribes, Matthew 23, 15, and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around the sea and land to make one proselyte, one disciple. And when he becomes one, uh, when he, when, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves, false teachers. Enticing, enticing words. All teachers are held, all preachers, all those who speak for God are held to a high, high, matter of fact, a higher standard. James 3, 1, not, let not many of you become teachers. My brother, knowing that as such will incur a stricter judgment, I know this is before me. I teach, I preach. If that's true of believers, what lies before those who have represented the word of God in some way, but yet are false teachers? Black darkness, black darkness, not a good day, not a good day. Measure those enticing words by, and what is being taught by what the word of God says. Always keep in mind that power li- their power, ha- uh, uh, they have powerful lies, and they trick and they persuade enticing words. Lastly, I want you to see their, their entanglement. It's in verses 19 through 22. Promising freedom. While they themselves are slaves of corruption, by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. See, they're promising. They're, that's their words, freedom here. There's freedom here, there's freedom here. And when that person, when someone naive or new in Christ or unknowing gets there, it's a prison. You can't escape it. And he says about these false teachers, that's where they're at, and that's what they bring. For it would have been better for them not to have known, excuse me, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the defilement of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. Peter is not saying, uh, and, and let me just explain this a little bit, verse 20. He's not saying these false teachers at one time knew Christ but now do not. He makes that very clear throughout this second chapter. He's mentioned again and again and again that they're condemned. But in verse 2, or excuse me, verse 1 of chapter 2, it says they even deny the master who bought them. That brings swift destruction. They never knew Christ. These false teachers Peter's describing, they never did. And then verse 21, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. And that is this. I believe that when they stand before the Lord, they're not going to be able to say, I never heard the gospel. I didn't, I, no one ever, ever shared that with me. No, they've heard it time and time and time again. 
and because of that, they, I believe, are going to be so and very regretful that way, that day. So notice their entanglement. By what enslaves them? What overcomes a man defeats, controls, whatever that is becomes his master. Whatever freedoms these false teachers are promoting, they are entrapped and enslaved by it. Peter flat out states that it has to do with immorality, with sensuality. So these false teachers by, were enslaved and captured by the very thing they were promo promoting some freedom from. And false teachers can be enslaved by a lot of things. So can believers. Immorality, power, money, the adoration of others. Those things can all enslave individuals. These false teachers were enslaved by that. If a Christian wants to find a church today that's okay with all kinds of, of, of things that are on the edge, premarital sex, cohabitation, some excuse for using pornography, redefining marriage, excusing away God's structure for the family and the church, you can find, you can find that in some teacher. You can find that in some place. You can go there, you'll find that. But it would be better for these to have not known the truth because when they stand before the Lord, they'll incur an even stricter judgment, I believe, for a number of reasons. They knowingly rejected Christ is one of those re reasons they were false teachers. Their entanglement by what is rejected. Remember the, the words of our Lord, I never knew you. Speaking of those who have done great things in his name. See, you see here, they have escaped the defilement of the world. Uh, and they are again entangled in that, in verse 20. That's what they embrace. Uh, they've rejected Christ. They've rejected the word. And again, they were never made a new creation in Christ. Never is it spoken of in Scripture that black darkness is reserved for believers. Matter of fact, we know in Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. They denied the master. They rejected the word or rejected the truth. They're enslaved. They rejected the truth. And notice what they've embraced. 22, it's happened to them according to the proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. A sow after washing returns to the wallow in the mire. They've really gone back to the world. Defiance of the world, that's theirs. They've embraced that. They've, they, they at one time escaped it, but they're back there. In other words, they've embraced the worldview. Whatever the world was teaching in that day, that's what they embraced. They embraced whatever the latest hot topic is in our society. They champion it. They run all over with it. Systematic teaching of the Word of God is not theirs. There's, no, there's none of that. They've gone back like a dog, like a sow. Not a pretty picture, right? But that's where they've gone back. Why have they gone back? Because there's nothing within them to stop that. They have no power within themselves. The Spirit of God is not in their heart. Is, is it that Christians can't ever do that? Yeah, they can. But we have the Spirit of God, and there's this thing called repentance where we can agree with God that that is wrong, and we ought not to go there. And we get it right, and we come back to him. And if any of these things that you've seen today, you've embraced in some way, and even as I talk, you know, there's these things that, if you're honest, you've embraced some false teaching, or maybe you've gone astray in some way, come back. God's waiting, arms wide open. That's our God. And to repent means to call it what it is. It's sinful. It's wrong. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move now. I've changed my mind. I've changed my thinking. I'm headed toward the Lord. But they went back like a dog like a sow. They knew the way of righteousness. It seems there was some change in them. And, and we can, in our own strength, give some outward change, but that can never happen within. There's no power there. It wasn't saving faith. Peter really makes it obvious. They never knew Christ. They're condemned time and time and time and time again. Verse 1, verse 3, verse 9, verse 12, verse 14, verse 17 of this chapter, he makes that clear. All right, let me pull this together, okay? There should be, listen to me, there should be a healthy fear of false doctrine, of false teaching in your heart and mind. There needs to be a healthy fear of that. I'm not God. 
I don't understand things perfectly. I am in process of growing to be more like Christ. I am in process of growing and understanding the word of God. But I don't know everything. Amen? And neither do you, right? We just don't. We don't know everything. So I want to know the word as much as I can. So when I hear something or see something or somebody comes to me with, hey, what do you think about this? Then I'm able to measure it. I'm able to see it. And if I don't know, I want to I know somebody that I can talk to, a really mature believer who's walked with the Lord a long time, has a great understanding of Scripture, and say, hey, what do you think about this? There's wisdom there. So I want, to, I want that before you. Have a healthy fear of false teaching. Have a healthy fear of that. And secondly, I'm going to press you into something that I've been saying for a couple weeks, and Peter finishes with it. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, somebody said, be, uh, uh, I'm not going to say it right. Something about stay hungry. Stay hungry. Keep pressing on. It's the word, the word, the word. Grow in the word. And it's interesting, in the next chapter, he just sets before us the word of God. He's finished this hard stuff in verse 2 of chapter 3. He just talks about the word spoken beforehand. Back to the word again. Not easy stuff. Maturity and growing in Christ, it takes time. You have to discipline yourself to the word. So, you know, I would want to say those things. Can you spot a counterfeit? Can you see it? You need to be able to. So I'll finish with this, all right? What? As simple as can get. I think this wraps up the second chapter, all the teaching there. Watch out. Church, beware. Watch out for false teachers. Be careful. Know your word. They're out there. He says that. We know that. Watch out for false teachers. Walk close to Christ. If you're here today and have never trusted Christ, again, I urge you, make a decision. Understand your need. Before God, you're not holy. You're not good enough. That's why he sent his son. And move, in, move to Christ and reach out in faith and say something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for providing the Savior. I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. And he'll save you right now. You know, it's amazing. The transformation that can come. If that's true, if that's what you need, you do that now, brother. Uh, then you will be brother, sister. Church, beware. Watch out for false teachers. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you. It's amazing to us that your care uh, for us would be such that you would preserve your word, that we might know. What we know about you, we see in your word. What we know about Christ has been revealed to us. You have given to us that which we otherwise would not know. We, we bless you for that. We thank you. For those that are here who have not yet trusted Christ as Savior, Father, move them that way. May they see their need. And may the devil not have a victory here. May they just cry out in childlike faith, I'm a sinner, save me. And we know it, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, for this body of believers, I pray that you would help them to be discerning in the uh, whatever comes their way, the doctrines that are out there, what's being taught, those who, who speak for you, may they see clearly truth and act on it. Bless, Father, protect, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.